Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, it's interesting that we're having all these testimonies. We, don't, we never really plan a testimony service, but sometimes people just testify about what God has done and what we're waiting for him to do and what we, what we believe he's going to do. Uh, this morning, I wanted to, I just felt the Lord leading me to speak a bit on uh, something that I normally would speak on on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, but I felt it necessary really this morning to talk about the wiles of our enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, and starting at verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's what we sang about. That's what we've been uh, speaking about. That's the testimonies, how people, how God helps us to be strong in the middle of temptation. He says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, a, a few years ago, in, there was a scandal in the NFL. You know what the NFL, National F Football League, for those of you that we don't know much about football in, Pis in Pittsburgh. <laughs> There was a scandal in the NFL, and what was happening is they found out that the New England Patriots, mm, the New England Patriots were stealing signals when a, <laughs> when a team would come in to play, they found a way to steal signals, so whether it was electronically or some way, and they were finding out what the team was going to do on the offense. Now, you know, it would be a great uh, asset that, you know, if you were a, a def on, on the defense and you found out it was going to be a pass, you would get your, you know, your backs running and covering. Uh, and you found out it was going to be like a reverse, you would catch it, okay? So they were stealing signals. And uh, it, it's the same thing like if you, if you ever follow baseball. If a batter knows what pitch is coming, if, he, if he's a good batter, I couldn't hit it if, even if I didn't know what pitch was coming. But... If a batter knew what pitch was coming, he, you know, he'd be looking for that pitch, and he's more likely that he's going to... See, it's important that we understand who our enemy is and how he operates. I don't like to glorify Satan, because he's just a loser anyhow. But we need to understand there's a lot of people that are, that are like kind of brain dead as to what, the way the devil works. And we find ourselves getting caught up in all kinds of stuff because we don't know his, uh, his approach. We don't know what his plans are. But Paul says right here, he says, you know, Satan has plans. He, has, he doesn't just kind of come on and, and, and try to trip people up, but he has, he has plans for everybody. He has a plan for your life. That's not a good one. If you're a non-believer, Satan tries to hinder you hearing the gospel. If, you, if, 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 if he already has you, he wants to do anything he can to thwart you hearing the gospel the Word of God. If you're a believer, He can't take you out of God's hand. He can't rob you of your salvation. But what He tries to do, He tries to get you to nullify your testimony. If you're a believer. And how He does it, you see, I've, I've said this, and in, in it's, it's, it's an important thought, that we as human beings, we respond to spiritual influence, spiritual stimuli, okay? Animals don't do that. They don't have a spirit. Animals are instinctive. If you have a dog or a cat, they act, you know, certain ways because that's their instinct. If you have a dog, he thinks you're the greatest thing in the world because you feed him and you're the big dog in the house, okay? If you give him to somebody else, he'll think that they're the greatest thing in the world. They can't choose to love or to hate. They don't have that ability. They do have affection and so forth, but they can't make that choice. But we as human beings, we choose who we love, who we don't like, who we like, who we hate. We make that choice. They are moral decisions. And the reason why we make that choice is because God makes choices, and we're created in His image. So He created us with that ability to choose things. So we are spiritual beings, and we're affected by spiritual influence. The things that's going on in the world today. People responding to spiritual influence, either good or bad, usually bad. Because there's a Holy Spirit, and there's an evil spirit. And they're not equal, by the way. This isn't you know, some philosophies say there's good and evil and there are equal forces. No. 
God is good. He's the creator. He created everything. Evil is the absence of good. And God is greater than evil. You know, I'm going to say something, and you're going to think I'm really stupid. You probably think that anyway, so that's all right. But all this stuff in, in the city of Pittsburgh, I've been living here for 57 years. Well, I can't I don't remember all that because when I was real young, I don't remember anything. But in the last week or so, there was like, like seven shootings in six days, five fatalities in five days. We're getting this flooding. I've never heard of that before. I've never heard of that flooding before at Washington Boulevard. I've been living here all this. I've driven up and down there a million times. People flooding and people getting killed. So what's going on? You know what I think's going on? You're going to think I'm stupid. I'll tell you what's going on. do 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 Batman. See, I happen to think there's a spiritual entity going on here somewhere. Now, you can say he's stupid. That's all right. You can call me stupid. There's some spiritual stuff going on here in this city because of dun, 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 the dark night. Everybody stand in line to go down the state. They want to be extras in the dark night. It's just my opinion. Okay. We're all allowed to have opinions, are we? Okay. All right. He says, you, he wants us to understand, he wants us to put on the armor of God to understand the wiles of the devil. How does the devil work? How does Satan operate? It's really, it hasn't changed in thousands of years. You know, God's the same. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Satan hasn't changed either. He's a created being. God, of course, isn't created. Satan's a created being. He hasn't changed. Sin is still sin. Life is still life. Death is still death. We, maybe some of the things surrounding all that stuff have changed, but it's still all the same. Satan has operated the same way from the very beginning, and he will until the time when he gets cast into the lake of fire. He deceives people. Spiritual influence. Now, you all know we're going to turn all the way to the very beginning because what we want to do this morning is study a little bit about the wiles of the devil. So it should be a Wednesday night message, but it's going to be a Sunday morning message. Genesis. Chapter 3. You all know that story. Some folks will tell you it's a fairy tale, but it's not. It's true. It's history. We've been, we've been watching uh, the last few Wednesday nights, we've been watching a video series about why does the gate, and they talked about evolution. Evolution is nothing but Hinduism with a scientific name to it. That's all it is. It's not science. They, they want to make you think it's science. It's not. Genesis chapter 3. And verse 1. Now the serpent, who's the serpent? He's the devil. You know the word devil means adversary. He is not our friend. Before I was saved, I used to think devil, the devil was my friend. Let me have a good time. He's not our friend. He says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And we're going to read here, we're going to see the, the, uh, the plan of how he operates. From the beginning until now, until the time he's cast into the lake of fire. He said to the woman, he didn't go to the man. He didn't go to Adam. God gave the command to Adam. You know, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them one commandment. And that commandment was, you can have everything in this garden is yours except this one tree I'm reserving for myself. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't know what kind of fruit was on it. It was an apple. We don't know. It doesn't matter. It's what God had reserved for himself. Specifically for himself. The only commandment. And what that commandment was, what a commandment is, it, it's a test of our love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So God gave one commandment to Adam and Eve that they might 
prove their love for Him by keeping that commandment. Plain and simple. It, everything else was theirs. So it's all yours. I wish I only had one commandment. <laughs> okay. Okay. The serpent came to Eve. He didn't go to Adam. You see, God gave the commandment to Adam, and Adam was supposed to convey that to his wife, and he did, but obviously not in a way that was effective. The serpent said to Eve, Has God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? He began his assault by questioning what God has said. He hasn't changed. It's still the same. You, 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 can, you can find... You know what? If you've got kids that want to go into ministry, don't send them to seminary. Because you know what they teach them in most seminaries now? They teach them... They'll say, well, this is, this is good folklore. It's good. But it's not. you can't really depend on it. They stop believing that God's Word is God's Word. They make it out to be something else. They say, oh, the Gospels, they're okay, but you really can't trust them because they've been rewritten and they've been retranslated and well, the one copied off the other and they come up with all these theories and everything. And it's not really God's Word. You can't really believe the prophets because they prophesied things that happened after they died, so they must have been written by two or three or four different people. And they question, they say, did God really say? God didn't say that. The first thing they'll do is plant a seed of doubt in your mind is what this word says. This morning we've heard testimonies about what God has done and what we're hoping for Him to do. And there's some people who will say, well, God didn't really do that. Just, you know, it's medical science. I thank God for medical science. Still God that brings the healing. You can take all the medicine in the world and still die. It's still God that brings the healing. But there's some folks who write that off. I've known people who have received healings. And, and I mean miraculous healings in, 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 their, in their bodies. And people say, well, it's just went in remission. God didn't really say that. That's the way he begins. That's the way he still does it today. You can't trust this word. You can't believe what this says. He said, did God really say that? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, God didn't really say anything about touching it, but essentially, she knew the commandment. Don't eat of the tree. Because if you do, you will die. You'll die. Plain and simple. Got everything else. Satan didn't come by and say, well, it was good that God gave you everything else. He focused on that one thing. The one thing that was taboo. The one thing that was forbidden. The one test of their love for God is what he focused on. And the serpent said unto the woman, you won't die. The first thing he did was question God's word. Then he called God a liar. He'll call God a liar. And he says, you won't die. Verse 5. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Not only did he call him a liar, but he questioned his motive. God just doesn't want you to be, he doesn't want you to get to the place where he's at. So he gave you this commandment, but he really lied to you. He wants to keep you bound. He wants to keep you in bondage. That's a lie that they, that's a lie people tell about God. That's, what, that's a lie that people use to keep them away from learning about God. Well, I don't want to be told what nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's like a human mantra, you know. I'm going to be my own destiny. I'm going to be my own God. He said, the devil said, God's word isn't true. He lied to you. He's really afraid of you. He doesn't want you to achieve Godhood. Which is the teaching of almost every other religion other than Christianity. It, you, you're your own God. You're in control. You manifest your own destiny. It's up to you. The same lie that Satan told Eve. He says, you won't die. 
God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's, knowing good and evil. So he questioned God's word, he questioned his motive, and really he's questioning his power, his sovereignty. God's not really in charge. He's just another little God, and you can be like him if you do your own thing. So, when the woman saw, in verse 6, that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband. And I, when I read this story, we're not told everything, but I'm wondering, where was Adam when this serpent was talking to Eve? Where was he? See, I watching a football game? I don't know. I didn't have that stuff back. Yeah, he had, he, was, he had ESPN on it. Where was he? Was he standing there? Was he just letting this go on? Did he intervene? What? We're not told. But I know one thing, if he wasn't there, he should have been. And if he was there, he should have been saying, get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus said when Satan tried to tempt him. But the woman took, and she ate of the fruit, uh, fruit, uh, fruit thereof, and did eat. And she gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice how Satan, notice where he started. He didn't start with Adam. But he started with a wife. You know. There's an old song that says, I'm a fool for a pretty face. I don't know if you ever heard that song or not. I'm not going to sing it. Adam succumbed to his wife. And there's a lot, there's a lot of teaching about that. But I just, I want to focus on what, on what our enemy did here. Because that's what, he's, that's what he's doing today. That's what he's doing in our government, in our churches, in our economy. It's, it's like you can be your own God. You don't have to follow what God says is right. You know, if, if, if our nation would handle its finances the way God says to handle its finances, we would not have a $14 trillion debt. If I would handle my finances the way God says, I might not have my debt either. God gives us principles in His Word. We talked about here a few weeks ago, we were talking about giving and what, what to do with, you know, your funds and so forth. And, but we don't listen. And I put myself in that, in that position. We don't listen. So when things go wrong, we say, oh, God, what's going wrong? Because He says, you didn't do what I told you to do. Now, we know the story here in, in the Garden of Eden where they were cast out because they failed the love test they believed what Satan, they believed Satan's lie about God. They believed that God was a liar. They believed that God was not sovereign. They believed that God did not have their best interest in heart. Have you ever felt that way? Even as believers sometimes. And they fell. The wiles of the devil. Question God's word. Appeal to the flesh. It says here in verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. T turn with me over quickly to 1 John chapter 2. Just going to show you some things this morning. I guess this ain't a shouting message this morning and that's all right. We'll have one next week maybe. Okay. 1 John chapter 2 and look at verse 14. Sorry, verse 15. The Apostle John writes to the church, Love not the world. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy nature and the beauty of nature. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the world system. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the, Father, the love of the Father is not in him. Eve fell in love with her version of the world that Satan presented to her. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. She saw that the, 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 the fruit was good for food, and it looked good. It was there to make one wise. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It hasn't changed. 
In the thousands of years between the Garden of Eden and John, and in the 2,000 years between John and now, it hasn't changed. It's the same. We're tempted. Satan tempts us with the things that appeal to our eyes, that appeal to our flesh, and the things that make us feel good about ourselves. Oh, self-esteem is like the watchword. Everybody got to have a good self-esteem. Self-esteem without the knowledge of God, you create a monster. See, self-esteem in Christ will, will bring self-control. Okay. But what Satan presented to Eve was, you need you know, self-esteem without, without the love of God. She did not love God. She loved the world. How many of us are tempted to fall in love with the things of the world and forsake the things of God? Because the things of God don't give us the instant gratification. The things of the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I mean, that's like a right now graph. We like things right now. We're no different than they were back in Eve's day. We like things right now. Fill my stomach right now. I'm hungry right now. I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I'm going to get high right now. On a mission. I sit on my front porch at 5.30 in the morning sometimes. I see people on a mission. Walking up and down Lichman Avenue. I'm telling you, I see it. They're gone, man. Knocking a boom, 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 boom. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It hasn't changed. To get an idea, now, this, this applies to us as individuals, applies to churches, congregations, applies to nations, it applies in every which way. Just to get an idea, of, of how, again, of how Satan works. And we're, we're studying the wiles of the devil. And the next time we might look at the armor of God, okay? I was going to try to fit it all in today, but it's going to be a little too much. But we're just going to look at the wiles today, and then uh, the next time we're going to look at the armor of God, okay? But look at this. Turn, turn over to the Revelation now. We were in the first book. Now we want to turn to the, to the last book. And chapter 2. In, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we find letters written to seven churches. Seven letters written to seven churches. And the letters are from Jesus to the churches through the Apostle John. Okay? These seven churches were located, and we did a study on, on uh, Revelation here a few a year or so ago, these seven churches were located in cities that were located in today what would be, would be Turkey, uh, the nation of Turkey, that was called Asia Minor. There were seven of them. They were kind of near in proximity to each other. And there were seven churches. And these churches represent, uh, there's a, there's, again, there's a lot of teaching about these, but these churches represent different kinds of churches. What, the, what you read here in these next two chapters, you'll, you'll see models of churches that are congregations that exist today. I say congregations because there's only one church. It's the body of Christ. But there are different congregations. So, two, two of these congregations were being attacked from the outside by Satan. The first one, or the second church that's mentioned, is the church in, in a city called Smyrna. And they were considered the persecuted church. They were being persecuted from the outside. Satan had, had uh, he couldn't infiltrate that church, so he got all the forces on the outside, and they were suffering persecution, official governmental persecution. They were, they were giving their lives for the faith. Jesus didn't have anything bad to say to them. The other church was the church of Philadelphia, which is the next to the last one, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but Philadelphia, who, which was in Asia Minor, the next to the last church in the, in the seven, they were, they were the church that was considered the outcast church. And again, Jesus had nothing bad to say to them. Satan was attacking them from the outside, trying to make them feel like they were outcasts, trying to push them out. Okay. It's one thing, I could deal with Satan attacking me from the outside. But the other five churches tell us what happens when Satan comes on the inside. Do you know Satan sends folks to church? I've said it before, every church has a strife minister. Okay. Every church got somebody in it that's going to stir up trouble. 
Every congregation. Every, every church is, is subject if, they're not, if they don't guard themselves. Paul talked about putting on the armor of God. If a congregation, the leadership of a congregation does not put on the armor of God, we become vulnerable to internal attacks. I can deal with attacks from the outside. If, if, if this nation begins, you know, if we start to see official persecution in this nation, I could deal with that. We can deal with that. We we'll pray for boldness. Pray for God's protection. But if we're not careful, Satan can come in. And these churches give us a little model of what Satan does when he comes in, when we let him in. Different ways he can tear apart and nullify the witness and the testimony of a congregation or an individual. Because that's what he wants to do with us. Remember I said that. For believers, Satan's goal is to nullify our testimony. Just empty words. In chapter 2, the Lord writes, Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus. We, we just read the letter to the Ephesians. That was written many years before this was. Write, These things say he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, your labor, and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and how you've tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Well, they were doing pretty good. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Man, these folks at Ephesus, they was, they was a hard-working church. But there was a problem. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left they didn't lose their first love. They left their first love. See, Ephesus was tempted to a works-related gospel. Ephesus was tempted by the enemy to work hard. And, 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 you know, it's good to work for the Lord. That's important to do that. But you know what? You can get so caught up in doing works that you forget why you're doing them. They left their first love. The next church was the church at Smyrna, and we talked about them. But the third church is listed here. Again, there's so much teaching about this, but is the church in Pergamos, verse 12 of chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he which has the sharp sword with two edges, which is the word of God, symbolically. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name, and you've not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. They, they were holding fast to God's word. They even had a person that gave their life for the faith. He says in verse 14, But I have a few things against you. Because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block to the children of Israel. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. They, this church at Pergamos, they were standing fast to God's word, but what was happening is they were beginning to compromise with the world. They were beginning to let all these other teachings in. And these movements in, and again, without going into great detail, the Nicolaitans were, were people who tried to exalt the clergy, and, and there's just a lot, of, there's a lot of teaching about this. But what was happening in the church, they were tempted to give in to the pressures to be like the world, to be conformed to the image of the world. Paul said in Romans, he says, be not conformed to the, to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are many churches today they say, if we can't beat them, we'll join them. If we can't get folks in here just by preaching the gospel, maybe we'll just, you know, we'll hire a DJ. <laughs> I don't want to. Okay. The next church was the church in Thyatira. Look at... Uh, chapter, uh, look at verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God who has the eyes like unto a flame of fire and his fear like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and, thou, uh, and the last to be more than the first. This church of Thyatira, they, they were a, 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 a generous church. They reached out to the lost. They, 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 they provided things for people that had needs. 
They had patience. They had faith. They had service. Verse 20, but they had a problem. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. The church in Thyatira was tempted to tolerate false doctrine that promoted sensual pleasure. If it feels good, do it. When we were watching these, this video presentation over the last couple of weeks on Wednesday nights, they were talking about, you know, churches having like yoga classes. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get in some of them positions if I wanted to. <laughs> but you know how they, you know, and they go, hmm. And they just, they just change it. Instead of doing the, the ohm thing, they'll like say the Lord's Prayer. Just as evil. But hey, you know, we'll get folks in and we'll help them feel good about themselves. There's a temptation to tolerate false doctrine if it if it meets the we're going back to what Satan said to Eve, you know, it's it'll make you like God. Same thing. The next church in chapter three was the church in Sardis. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things say, He that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, and that you live and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. The church in Sardis was tempted toward complacency. But we got church. We got church every Sunday. We got the things going on, and we can just kind of sit back and... Whoop. It's like... It's like, you know, these, those are the churches you go in and you, you sit there for about five minutes and you start to, you know, you start to kind of like doze off. Dead church. God help us. I never want to have a dead church. I hope this church never gets dead. Man, we'll pray, you know, praise the Lord and make noise. I, I've been in a few. Maybe you have two churches. They just sit there and it's just like, it's like you hear a pin drop. Mm. They were tempted toward complacency. We can, we can start to be complacent with what we got and just take it for granted and do the same thing over and over and over again. And, and, and you know, there have been churches that for years and years have gone through the same ritual over and over and over and over again. And they've never once stepped outside the door to try to preach to somebody else or draw somebody in. Because they didn't have anything to offer them. Complacency. Finally, the last church. Starting at verse 14. These are the wiles of the devil. This is what he does. To try to lull us to sleep. To try to get us into. And unto the angel of the church at Laodicea. Right. These things says the amen, the faithful, and the true witness of beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. That you're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. He says, he says, because you say I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, this church represents, this congregation represents the self-sufficient, lukewarm body of believers, or so-called believers. They got everything going for them. They got all the stuff. Everything they need. They figure God has blessed them because they have everything they need. But they don't care about the gospel. A man named Francis Chan preached the message. Lukewarm and loving it. I believe this is the time we're living in. Where you got folks... In churches, big churches, small churches, churches of all different kinds of persuasion, you know, Church of God, Assembly of God, blah, 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 all these, all these different denominations. There are churches where people are sitting up in there with their feet kicked back and think, man, we got it all going. And don't give two hoots about anything that Jesus says. What does Satan say? God didn't really say. Well, we don't, we don't really, I mean, yeah, we can, we can read the Word. I mean, yeah, we have daily, you know, we got our daily bread and it, it's good. But, I mean, it's not really. Saints, we need to put on the whole armor of God. We'll talk about that next time.
But we need to understand how Satan works. And there's so, much, so many more different places we can go where we can see how, he's, how he gets in. You need to believe. You need to know this. That you have an adversary that wants to get in. Wants to get into your life. Wants to get into your family. Wants to get into our church. Wants to get into the government. Wants to get, you know, we need to understand so we can keep him from getting in. See, we have the authority over him in the name of Jesus. You don't have to take what he says. You know, Adam could have said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus said. When he was tempted in the wilderness, Amen. Satan came along and said, make these stones bread. He was fasting for 40 days. And, and Satan came and said, well, you're hungry, Jesus. Go ahead and have something to eat. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He quoted God's word. Satan came to him and said, hey, Jesus, go jump off that top of that temple and, and let the angels come down and pick you up. And Satan even quoted a scripture to him too. Uh, he said, the, 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 the angel will come and pick you up and you can show everybody what a great God you are. You're like, you know, the dark night here. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to test. You don't test God. He used God's word. Then Satan said to him, hey Jesus, look, he took him to a big high mountain. He said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. When Adam sinned, he gave them to me. When Adam sinned, he turned over the sovereignty that was originally his. In the garden, over all the things, he turned it over. And Satan said, look, Jesus, I'll give them all to you. You don't have to go to the cross. Just worship me. It'll be all yours. And Jesus said, get thee behind me. Believers need to start saying, get thee behind me, Satan. When they come, listen. When he comes and whispers in your ear, you're crazy. You're going to lose your mind. We need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. When he comes and he says, you're going to lose your house. You need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. When he comes and he says, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your family. You're, we, need to, we, we need to say, get thee behind me, Satan. For God's word says, he will never leave me or forsake me. As God's word says, I've, I've, never, I've never seen a righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. God's word says, He will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. Satan, get thee behind me in the name of Jesus. That's our weapon. You, you need to know where He's coming from. See, God wants to give you the, he wants to give you the signals. You know, like the, like the patriots used to steal. He wants to let you know where he's coming from. He got a whole word full here. Grab a hold of this this morning. And we're going to pray. That you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You've heard that. A lot of you guys heard me say this a million times. You know, they used to say, oh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Satan hates you and has a horrible plan for your life. But you don't have to buy into it. If you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Claim your family. Our sister Lori is talking about claiming your healing. Claim your family. Claim your children that are wayward. Claim, claim those that you've been praying for. Don't give up praying for them. Because the enemy has no authority over us. Jesus said this. Stand with me. Jesus said this. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell might not, maybe will, shall not. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church and my people in the name of Jesus. That's God's word. That's the word of Jesus. That's not my word. Hallelujah. If, you know, if, if I tell you how I feel sometimes, I'll tell you, well, I don't know. But Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing new under the sun. The stuff we see going on in the news and in the, in the world and all this other stuff going on, we know it all has a spiritual it all has a spiritual uh, entity, a connection. Father, the devil can't make us do anything, 
But so often, Lord, we listen to his voice. He comes just like he did with Eve, and he says, Oh, God didn't really mean that. He didn't really say that. Father, we need to be, we need to be familiar with what your word says, and we need to stand on your word. Because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will never change. Father, my prayer is for everybody within the sound of my voice. I look out and I believe that most of these folks are saved. Father, if there's one here that isn't, we're here to lead them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I want to encourage you, if, you, if you're not saved, if you don't know the Lord, don't leave this place this morning. We're going to pray and we're going to dismiss, but I'm going to be here for a while. And if you need to pray, if you need to know Jesus Christ, please come. But Father, my prayer is for the ones in this room that know you, that have been to the cross, that have been covered and washed in the blood of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would walk circumspectly, that we would realize how Satan operates, that we would realize the spiritual reality of an adversary who wants to destroy everything. He wants to destroy our testimony. Father, I pray, God, that you would give us the ability and the strength, Father, that we would call upon the discernment to be able to call upon your name. We have the authority. You said in the name of Jesus. We could do all things. So Father, we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. We come against the enemy right now. And Father, I want to pray right in the name of Jesus. You might know somebody that you think is oppressed by a devil. Or maybe you think you know somebody that might be possessed by a devil. We curse that devil in the name of Jesus. We take authority and we believe, Father, we pray that we will see changes in the lives of those people we've been praying for in the name of Jesus. Not because we say so, because we're standing on your word. We're claiming your word in the name of Jesus. We believe you're able. We thank you for the testimonies we have heard and we're expecting to hear more. We're not demanding it, Lord. We're expecting it. Because you are who you say you are. In the name of the Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our great and mighty God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Close. Not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean. On Jesus' name, on Christ the Son.